Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. I'm really pleased to have Frank Holmes with me once again. Frank has been on this show a number of times, and he is a constant guest on mainstream media outlets. So um, you, you probably all know Frank Holmes very well, but you should, however, go to usfunds.com, usfunds.com, to learn of all the financial opportunities that are provided under the U.S. Funds umbrella that Frank heads up. Frank is also the interim executive chairman of Hive Blockchains Technologies. That's a company that mines uh, both Bitcoin and Ethereum, and it trades in Canada and the United States under the symbol HIVE. It's a very interesting company and one that I hope um, you all have a chance to uh, to check out. I certainly want to learn more about it, uh, which is why I'm really happy to say that Frank is with us. Thanks for joining me today, Frank. It's great to be with you, Jay. You know, um, I saw Ray Dalio the other day. Ray Dalio was interviewed on CNBC, uh, and he said that the government will kill cryptocurrencies because they can and because they won't want to give up their monopolistic control over, over money. At least that was what he implied. And China recently did crack down on cryptocurrencies and so I'm, I'd like to ask you, as chairman of, of a company that produces cryptocurrencies, how has that changed your perspective of the cryptocurrency markets and industry? Well, first of all, it's much bigger than, than government thinks. And, and I think that that's a, a well-known statement that actually came out today. I think George Soros was on CNBC saying uh, the government has to find a way to manage and be with it, and uh, they can't just unilaterally come out and stop it because it's decentralized. Uh The the simple part for your listeners to understand what Bitcoin is, Bitcoin uh, validates a technology which is called triple entry accounting because of its transparency. It was created in 1991 by the telecom companies to move money. And nothing happened to it until someone, someone known as Satoshi came along and created Bitcoin as a private asset, private mm-hmm. property. Everything that Bitcoin has to do with it is about private property. Cash in your, in your bank account is the bank's cash. Until you get it in your pocket, then it's yours. It's in bearer form. And the same thing with gold jewelry. If you have 24 karat gold jewelry in many places in the world, it is money. It's, it's what you, people use in a crisis. So they, these are assets that, that, are, that the crypto space is captivated with. And they have 13,000 validators. You know, there's not 300 countries that are basically validating in an open architecture around the world every transaction on that, that, that ecosystem. And when you look at Ethereum, you have 30,000. Hmm. Uh, and, and so this is and, and, uh, the big thing, Jay. You and I have spoken at these conferences, Jay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're free. Okay? They're free. Mm-hmm. The crypto conferences, they're $1,500, and they're sold out. They're scalpers. <laughs> if, if, if you're a whale, I'm an institutional investor. You know what it costs uh, to be a whale if you want to pay a ticket for at these crypto events? 15000 no Fifteen thousand, Jay, and they're yeah. sold out. So you can go to London, sold out. You go to Singapore, sold out. You go to Miami, sold out. Go to New York, sold out. So wherever you go in the world, this is really important to recognize. It's decentralized, and it's a global phenomena that people are trying to protect private property rights. Mm-hmm. And the biggest political battle is the more left or socialist a government, the more they are anti crypto because they want to control all financial assets or even mm-hmm. just deem a financial asset. Mm-hmm. So where you get this, sort of, this riffraff and, and it is digital gold uh, is what it really is. And, and so there's this phenomenon going on, but it's growing when PayPal comes out and gives fractals. So you can buy a fractal of a Bitcoin. Uh-huh. Those kids that got their fourteen hundred dollars last year from President Trump and rolled it into Bitcoin and PayPal, it went to worth twelve thousand uh-huh. uh, so, dollars. So guess what? I, let, let, let me finish this. Important yeah. for your listeners because they're older, like me and you. Yeah. We're old guys. Yep. I wear a Bitcoin shirt or I wear an Ethereum shirt, and I get compliments all over the place, traveling, etc. I wear go gold. And they don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe it's <laughs> old age. You know, like, this is important for people to grasp there's something bigger going on. 
Mm-hmm. And, and so I, 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 I've never saw this with gold, even in the heydays of the ginger mm-hmm. mining and back in three, four, five, six, in that time period. So this, this idea of private property and this battle that's going on is very important, whereas a lot of kids, the difference are that these kids are buying crypto to not just stay ahead of inflation, but to make money. Mm-hmm. And the gold world is about devaluing slowly your paper value, purchasing power, so it's more of a defensive positioning. The young kids, they don't, they're, they're not consumed with playing defense, they're consumed with playing offense. Mm-hmm. And that is what it offers. So mm-hmm. That's where your, your battle is. The Chinese mm-hmm. themselves were, wanted to, the Saudis to take uh, renminbi for their oil. And they said, mm-hmm. no, we only want U.S. dollars. And, mm-hmm. and the U.S. dollars, the U.S. has a big military, and U.S. Is also has more important, has a lot of gold in Fort Knox. And, and so what's happened is that China continues to consume gold. Uh, and, and I think that this is an important part to, like, to legitimize the renminbi. And they're also fast-tracking digital money. They're much further ahead than the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they want to so that everything will be in a digital format. Mm-hmm. And, and so that will say, well, that, that digital money is convertible into renminbi, and renminbi's got gold behind it. That's the sort of tectonic plate shift when you look at the macro scenes of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but as, as a digital Bitcoin, they do not want any competition with their digital money. They have nothing. You know, they just don't want, they don't, and that's what you see out of Europe, uh, that mindset. And then you see that um, a lot of sort of, they call FUD. It's a really important word for your listeners, F-U-D. Uh, and, and it stands for basically false information or un- uncertainty and doubt. So Propaganda tries to drop you know, innuendos that are doubting, innuendos that are uncertain, and, or just out and out lies false information. And a lot of that crypto ecosystem, they will quickly go after any statements by government or someone that's making some other statement is that's a FUD statement. And what we hear is that uh, all these criminals are using Bitcoin, etc., but it's actually de minimis compared to dollars and euros uh, mm-hmm. that are used for, for illegal trade. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I, I think it's part of that whole FUD to try to discredit it. But in that light, it continues to grow, and it continues to have a bigger and broader audience. So if there's something big happening. Mm-hmm. Well, the something big, Frank, would be the, the you know private property rights, which you know we Americans at least have believed is a God-given right. Uh, we've earned the property. We should own it. It should be ours. At the same time, you have increasing amounts of socialism. So my question to you is, how does Mr. Soros and his socialists get a, get a, get a hold of this? Is it, is it to circumvent, circumvent Bitcoin by doing something like you're suggesting with the uh, Chinese yuan that would be backed by, by gold? Do you think that's what he has in mind, possibly? Possibly, and, um, but no one really is going to trust them. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the hardest part for a lot of those places, they don't have a religion, a cultural religion. The religion is communism. That's mm-hmm. religion. And, uh, and so they end up worshiping money, worshiping money more than anything else. Where mm-hmm. If you go into America, Canada, you go to Europe and, and, and many places, that, that there's a value system and a cultural value system. Uh, it doesn't happen in that, in that Chinese ecosystem. Uh-huh. They, they uh-huh. don't want any religion. And, then, and, yeah. and so it's interesting to see what they did. They believe that capitalism is just a stepping stone to go back to communism. So they use mm-hmm. it as a way to get caught up with infrastructure, etc., uh, and steal the innovation from America and other places, and now they want to revert back to communism. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly where that, where that path is going, but I think there's too many educated people in America and they go back, and I don't think they're going to accept it uh, mm-hmm. to the degree that they're trying to push it. And, uh, but that's their problem. Our mm-hmm. problem as, as money managers is we've got to try to stay ahead. And how can I stay ahead of all this money printing? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and clearly, uh, gold has been, is, 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 over the past 21 years, uh, 80% of the time except for this year, gold has been positive, mm-hmm. uh, and some years better than others. So there, it, it just doesn't make rational sense that we would have such negative real interest rates uh, and where we are that gold. Gold is the greatest right now 
big bounce trade and, and mm-hmm. how the G7 finance ministers are working as a cartel and, and manipulating the price of gold in some form or fashion mm-hmm. um, with a repo agreement with some this country or that country. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But there's something going on because they were if they were able to get a flat tax of 15% corporate tax in those seven countries against all those corporations, which has mm-hmm. always been a way to stifle innovation, that's a very socialistic mindset. Mm-hmm. And they were able to do that. So, therefore, to continue their money uh, printing mechanism, they have to make sure that gold doesn't take off. Right, that's a exactly. Way. So, the issue is is that um, the they have the futures market, and the futures market is highly leveraged. Is that the mechanism? I really don't know, but I do believe that there's something there that it, that is uh, very peculiar for me um, because the love trade continues to be very robust. Uh, gold going to China and India, uh, going mm-hmm. to it's still highly correlated to GDP per capita, um, and. Uh, and I think if we take a look where inflation is not going away, I've been saying that for, for 18 months now. If you look at uh, uh, the real inflation is a point a month right now. Oh, for sure, and yeah. so if you can borrow and buy good assets, gold mining companies as a whole, the 100 stocks we follow, they're the, they're the, the, many of them are showing high free cash flow yields. So oh, they're much sure. wiser. They're, they're not taking big risks on mergers and acquisitions, uh, and therefore they're not replacing those production reserves as fast. They have to be much more cautious, uh, and so I just think we're we're due here that some, there'll be a reset button, and we're going to see gold two thousand, twenty five hundred, three thousand, uh, yeah. based on negative real interest rates. That's where it could easily, and it, I think it could easily run to. You think we see higher prices before the end of the year? For yeah, gold? I think in this fourth. Yeah, I think in this quarter we do. Um, I don't think they're going to. I, I look at the PMIs. I write about them every month. And the PMIs are, 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 are getting sloppy. Um, if you look at China, which is so key, it's rolled over. Um, if you look at some of the European countries, it's rolled over. So that just means the money printing stays strong. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have supply shockers happening all over that are triggering inflation. Uh, inflation is going to fall through, and all the um, because of oil and gas or where it is, uh, it's going to flow through into this. Into the, it, it's going to make inflation sustainable. It's not just a temporary phenomena. Uh, these higher energy prices, because everything we touch, paint, plastic, uh, you name it, is, is some type of an ingredient of oil into it, and so that is just embedded inflation. Mm-hmm. Even coal. Even coal has gone through the roof uh, mm-hmm. by shrinking supply of mines uh, because of the green movement, and mm-hmm. then you have higher energy prices. So I, I think that uh, having not having gold at this time, it's one of the great country in trades. Uh, and, and if you can borrow, look at look at real estate in the U.S. was up 19% last year. That's been a great yeah. trade to be long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the liquid one is gold. The other one has yeah. been a great trade has been crypto. Yeah. And I'm really delighted to share with you because you've been following the Hive story. It's the first yeah. crypto mining company. It only uses green energy. Well, we reported our year-end March uh, uh, 10 days ago, and it's the highest yeah. of all the crypto mining companies. And then we reported this past quarter, uh, the end of June, and uh, we made close to uh, $18 million on $37 million in revenue. Um, yeah. So we are the, still the most profitable crypto mining company, and we mining Ethereum and Bitcoin and holding, and that means we hold on for dear life. And that's another good point, Jay. These gold mining companies, I've urged them they should be doing what the crypto kids do, hodl, hold on for dear life. <laughs> that's on the long-term <laughs> trade. Not quickly sell you. If you're a gold producer and you've got free cash flow, well, darn, you think gold's cheap, then stop selling it. Well, this is this leads me to a question, Frank, in terms of how you recognize your income. Now, I notice just to make uh, if forty three point five million net income is what you reported last year, and I think as you just said, eighteen point six million for the first quarter of this year. Your year ends uh, March thirty first, I guess. So we're in the first quarter of twenty twenty two. Right now, how do you how do you generate the? Well, first of all. You do sell some coins, I suppose. You have to have some cash flow to meet your expenses, right? Yep. So you do sell some, but you try to hold as much as you can. And you have, I think, as I saw a pie chart. You're about two-thirds is Ethereum and one-third is Bitcoin on your balance sheet. Is that right? 
more or less? Yeah, now it's rotating out that Bitcoin's taking a bigger position. Um, oh. But here's, here's what's you know, interesting. It's just a good question you ask. We did an ATM, and the ATM is at the market mechanism. And mm-hmm. it basically says that you've got two years to raise $100 million. And you sell shares whenever you want. So mm-hmm. you can do, and so what we've done is, in particular, earlier this year when Bitcoin and prices were crazy in February, uh, we sold, a, we raised, did raising money. We took that capital, and it allowed us to mine and keep all of our coins and not sell. And it also allowed us to buy sixty million dollars worth of new equipment. So now, if you look at our balance sheet. Uh, from a year ago, we had less than $5 million in Bitcoin and Ethereum assets. Now it's worth over $100 million. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, now, so that, that, that $80 million I think our ATM ended up raising, that went into basically keeping our mining our own coins, and it went into buying $60 million worth of new equipment to upgrade everything. So net-net, the shareholders had greatly benefited because because. That eighty million is worth one hundred and thirty million, I think, uh, as of today. Um, and uh, you, you, so eighty into one hundred and thirty million plus you spend sixty million on new equipment. That's going to last for many more years. So we're in a. It's been a great way to raise capital. Uh, the royalty companies like Wheaton River and Franco Nevada a year ago, mm-hmm. they raised five hundred million dollars in that mechanism. So mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. were able to go and then buy royalties, fund projects, and keep maintaining, increasing their dividend. So I, I think it's a, it's a great way uh, of raising capital. Well, long term, Frank, the, we, we know that uh, Bitcoin has limits to how many can be mined, essentially. What is the long term program for, for Hive? Well, Hive, Hive has, um, it's, it wants to be the premier. Green only, 100% green uh, energy, uh, hydroelectricity or geothermal like mm-hmm. we have in Iceland. Um, we'll go to solar, uh, but otherwise that's how we're focused on. And um, uh, and we want to be able to keep a lot of those assets on the balance sheet. The uh, SEC appears is not going to allow a uh, Bitcoin ETF still, but maybe one that could buy futures market. Uh, so what happens is that um, it's a derivative of a derivative, whereas when you buy Hive, we have those assets on our balance sheet. Uh, mm-hmm. and so we get an audience of people that are reluctant to go to one of these crypto exchanges to buy some Bitcoin or Ethereum or Coinbase. So Hive becomes the proxy because mm-hmm. we hold all those coins and we also mine and make profits from it. Frank, with just a couple of minutes left yet, I noticed this morning you uh, added a person named Diana Briggs, uh, Diana Biggs, uh, to your board, and she is the CEO of Valor Inc. and the incoming Chief Strategy Officer of uh, DeFi Technologies. What can you tell us about Diana Biggs and how she fits into uh, Hive's plans as well, a board first member? Of all, she's she's, she's um, a very smart person that has an engineering degree from uh, McGill University Mm -hmm. uh, in Montreal. She has has an American uh, uh, passport also and a European one. She uh, lives in Switzerland, and she is one of the leading early people, an investor in Bitcoin when it was a dollar and (laughs) Ethereum when it was a nickel. (laughs) Um, so, um, she's, she's, you know, economically pretty smart, pretty, uh, but she was ahead of HSBC's innovation labs. Uh Uh-huh. And, and, uh, so she brings to us that intellectual capital, uh, of where the new trends are going, NFTs or whatever it is, is, is going. Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, you certainly are doing well. I mean, it's, I see uh, the stock was about three dollars and two cents when I checked on it right before the show today, Frank. And uh, it's certainly um, a very interesting story. And I look forward to keeping up with you on this going forward. That's for sure. Well, thank uh, any any last word? You? Yeah, there's a quant guy in, in Matt Caser that does a quant approach based on Chicago Hold Advisory called Cash Flow Return on Invested Capital and ranks all the stocks in Canada and does by industries and Hive is in the top 10% of all stocks in the country. So, and it's worth about $5 uh, US on his uh, model for highest cash flow returns on capital. And just go to usfunds.com if they need more information about our funds. And uh, one last thing, Jay, we didn't talk about mm-hmm. Wheels Up. 
Uh, last week, Biden passed a law that basically allows Europeans to fly directly and land here, and uh, all the airlines started picking up. Uh, $200 million of new money came into Jets ETF, which is interesting. Uh, so there's more positive uh, on ability for people to fly. So there's, there's good news for the economy. Very good news. Thank you very much, Frank. 